Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight for this session of the Bison Transport Sport Leadership Series, Breaking the Bias. My name is Anastasia Busis, and I will be your host tonight and throughout the rest of the series. Uh, can you believe this is our fourth session? I, it's just gone by so quickly. We've had so many wonderful um, evenings with just great panelists, and tonight will be uh, very similar. I'm super excited to talk about Breaking the Bias. It is, of course, very close to my heart. Just quickly, uh, once upon a time, I was a two-time Olympian in long track speed skating. Uh, I skated for 24 years. It has been the gift that has kept on giving in my life. And um, prior to my second Olympic Games in Sochi 2014, I publicly came out in opposition of Russia's anti-LGBTQ laws. So this is very, very close to my heart. Uh, I am now on the media side of things. I work for CBC Sports where I host Players Own Voice, the podcasts, and a number of our national uh, linear platforms and digital platforms. And uh, I get to watch and talk about sports all day, every day. So I've got a great job and I'm very, very humbled and honored to uh, be joining this conversation once again tonight. This series brings together inspirational leaders from all areas of sports to tell their personal and professional stories, offer valuable advice and guidance, ensure practical tips that participants can use on and off the field of play. Sport Manitoba would like to begin by acknowledging the land on which we work, live and play are the traditional lands and waterways of the Anishinaabe, Cree, the OG Cree, the Dakota and Diné peoples, as well as the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties made here and are grateful to work, live and play on this land. Sport Manitoba values and welcomes the opinions of all participants and strives to offer a safe space where respect for speakers and guests is maintained. Welcome, welcome, welcome to all our attendees and uh, in particular, our friends at Bison Transport. We're excited to have you all with us tonight. Sport Manitoba, in partnership with Bison Transport, aspired to increase female engagement in sport by, by providing an informative, inclusive and inspirational experience throughout the series. And, uh, Big news, March 7th, everyone put this in your calendar, if you still have a calendar, I don't know, or just your phone, but March 7th, uh, of course, the day before International Women's Day, we're going to be hosting another session, but this time it's actually in person. I am so lucky, I will be there. Um, I'm just so excited to connect with this wonderful community that we've built uh, throughout this year and, and the previous two years. Um, and this is really kind of the, the Bison Transport Sport Leadership finish line. So again, March 7th, it will be 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. Uh, at the Manitoba Sports Hall of Fame. It'll be hosted by previous series guest speaker, Canadian former volleyball player and newly inducted member of the Manitoba Sports Hall of Fame, Michelle sawatsky Coop. Uh, registration is open at sportmanitoba.ca slash leadership. Remember, it's not just leadership, it's lead her ship. Um, and I'm, again, once very touched and humbled to be providing the keynote about redefining success for yourself. I really believe that happiness is an inside job. Um, unfortunately, when I was skating, I really struggled with my mental health, real, uh, real struggles with anxiety and depression. Um, I struggled to accept myself, to love myself. And throughout that journey and into my journey now as a, as a broadcaster, that's been kind of a cornerstone of, of my value and, and, and my life. So very excited to expand on my own story. I get to chat with a lot of athletes, as I said, and um, sometimes I get sick of my own voice, but I'm, I'm just thrilled to, uh, to connect with you all. And there's going to be a huge opportunity to engage with others, participate, participated in our virtual session, sorry, uh, huge networking opportunities. There'll be food and drinks, there'll be prizes. It'll be a blast. So please put it on your calendar, March 7th. Uh, a, a few housekeeping things before we get started. If you are having issues with your stream, click on Click here to refresh stream under the video player to view our alternate stream. And if you're having any tech issues, click on the help button on the bottom right corner of the webcast page. Your help request will be emailed back to the email address you provided. So whatever email you registered with, just keep checking that uh, because that's where all the help will go. And lastly, throughout tonight's session, we encourage you to ask questions using the question box on the right hand side of the webcast and to engage on social media with you know, whatever platform that may be, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, tag Sport Manitoba and use the hashtag lead her ship. Uh, and we are so excited to get started with our guests tonight. So let's meet them now. Hello, my name is Jaya Kashik and I'm the HR coordinator with Bison Transport. 
Lorraine Lafreniere is the Chief Executive Officer of the Coaching Association of Canada. Lorraine has spent more than 30 years dedicated to Canada's sports system and has held roles with the Canadian Olympic Committee, Cycling Canada and Canoe Kayak Canada. She prioritizes safe sport in her roles within Canada and around the world. Lorraine is the mother of two children and is a proud cancer survivor. She believes in the power of sport to unite, heal and grow. Addie Miles Abbott has been a coach ever since she graduated from the University of Manitoba in 2012 after playing for the Bison women's hockey team. She has lots of experience between being a player, recruiter, mentor, head coach, assistant coach, and skills coach, and finds that there are not too many situations on the ice that she has not experienced. Addie helped the Bison's program claim its first ever Canvas Championship as a player and has been fortunate to have continued her career in hockey beyond being an athlete. Now, as a coach in the program, she was a part of the U Sports National Championship in 2017 till 2018. As a coach, she's committed to being a positive force in every athlete's career, encouraging players to continue to grow as individuals on and off the ice. Joanne Kelly is a former broadcast journalist with CTV Winnipeg and Vancouver and Shaw TV. She's been teaching in the Creative Communications program at Red River College for 12 years, hosts a book segment on CBC Radio and writes book reviews for the Winnipeg Free Press. Welcome, everyone. Woohoo! Okay, let's get right into it. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, first and foremost, I'm just going to give you a an easy one, but uh, I'd love to get to know a little bit about um, everyone, just just a bit more. And I, I suppose my first question is, you know, Addy, we heard that you were obviously an athlete, right? Like, I, I think everyone was drawn to sport, but was there an exact moment when you're like, oh, this is exactly what I should be doing? And how does that relate to really seeing the power of sport? Addy, we'll start with you. Well... Like when you talk about a specific moment, I come from a music family, so I was never involved with sports. And then I literally go out onto the street, play street hockey for five minutes, come in the house and ask my parents to buy me everything. I'm like, can I play hockey for the rest of my life? This is the funnest thing I've ever done. And I think it was probably that week they had me registered in hockey. And honestly, the the rest is history. Like it's, it's really been, I moved away from home to play hockey at a young age. It's brought me through my university career. Um, sports has really been a driving force in my life and have been able to integrate it really into every path that I've taken. Oh, it's so cool. Uh, Lorraine, I mean, you have such a formidable um, resume as well. Like, was there an exact moment when you went, Ooh, this is what I should be doing. This is exactly where I need to be. Well, it's kind of interesting to hear Addy talk a little bit about music because that was actually my first love as a teenager uh, in high school, you know, with the usual things for most, most young people, you know, with all the changes happening uh, intellectually, emotionally, mentally through your teenage years. And I picked up a classical guitar and I fell in love and um, it actually kind of led me to my path to to sport because I really believe they're connected. I think that culture is expressed through music and sport. And so I fell into that career kind of in a pathway of um partly my following my family's footsteps, but also just because I could feel the connectedness. So it happened in my 20s to join the sport world. But as soon as I saw the sport world, I mean, it was kind of like the, I'm sure my face lit up in the sense that, oh, I could, I could get behind this, you know, I can see the power of this. So that's really what, where my journey was that led me into sport. 
Cool. Uh, Joanne, you're on the media side of things. You know, was there a moment where you were like, ah? <laughs> oh, and you're muted. Sorry. Can you believe it that it's it's February 2023 and we like you know what I mean? I do that too. Don't even worry about it. Virtually, and I still do that. Um, well, it's I mean, there, I come at this from so many angles because there's the the storytelling aspect, right? That that you and I both do with with sports, and um, I I love hearing about you know music and sports being that cultural element because that's how I teach sports journalism, right? I'm not teaching people to go cover play by play or statistics I'm like find the human element and and for me sports was always really scary I I the least athletic child you'll ever meet and it wasn't I started running in my 30s and in my 50s I started kayaking and cross-country skiing and hiking and all of a sudden getting how important that is the the sports element I mean, I may not play on a team, but I kayak in a group and I cross country ski in a group and I run marathons and there's such a community, right. With, with sports and uh, a lot of, a lot of empowerment. It's, it's very powerful. I love that you say the human um, element again, sorry, I guess this is a shameless plug, but I, I have a little podcast called players own voice and it's human first athlete second. Um, so how would you define that? Like what, how do you define that angle to your students when you say really be human first? Well, we, we talk a lot. They're doing a sports assignment for me right now and um, they need to be at an event and they need to, to weave in some uh, elements of the game, but the focus has to be the, a person. It has to be the human element of how either sports has impacted this person or how they're impacting the sport. Right. And I mean, my favorite, my favorite stories that I've ever covered in sports, I always had a slightly different angle than the sports casters and, uh, you know, finding, finding those human connections, uh, it to me is what good storytelling is about. And it's, it's what I teach with sports is to be a good sports reporter I don't care how well you know the stats of a game. I need to know that you can connect with a human being mm -hmm. as a human being. And, and that will make you a good sports reporter or a good reporter, period. Cool. Um, so then we, you know, you hear these horrible statistics, like 4% of, you know, media is dedicated to women's sports. Um, Addy, you played, you coach now, just from your perspective, like, how integral is it for your athletes to see role models in media? Well, it's, it's so interesting to hear um, Joanne's, you know, uh, her exam or her paper that she's getting her students to write, because I believe that history behind sports is what people really that emotion is what connects everybody through sports. So I always think of, cause I grew up in a big Montreal Canadians house. Like you grow up feeling the passion of a Montreal Canadians fan before you even know a player's name. Right? right. And that's one of the things that girls miss out on, you know, when we're looking at girls, especially when they're 10 and under, when they're starting to learn about sports, when they're starting to understand you know, how society works and how all these start like fundamentally work together as young women. That is one of the biggest things, especially what we're doing at Beauties is we're trying to reach a younger group of young female athletes that are excited to hear stories from a bunch of different people, but also be able to connect emotionally to what is actually available for them so that they understand at a way, way younger age of what they can actually accomplish. Like I've got a little guy, he's four years old and he is telling me he's in the NHL and he's the, you know, and I'm like every young skater that I come across, I'm always like, have you heard of the professional women's hockey league? Have you heard of all these different things? Because you can be her. And then it's like all these conversations start where then you can start to connect those stories and create that sense of emotion. So yeah, that stat, that stat breaks my heart when I hear things like that. And I think that it's, you know, a collective of everybody talking about it more. 
right? Like yeah. having those conversations. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, uh, Lorraine, I-, I would love to go to you. Um, you obviously have great power. Um, it's weird to say that so bluntly, but you know, again, you've had such a formidable career. Um, just how important is it for you to really shed light, light and, you know, increase and elevate the influence of women in sport? Oh boy. So that's a, so, uh, you know, as I said to you before, Anastasia, I'm, I'm into leaning in, uh, into any topic, uh, that really can help change sport for the better. That includes safe sport. That includes gender equity. It includes DEI, all of it. So I, I feel that our role, so let me just take a second to say at the coaching association of Canada, I feel our job is to help sports deliver their sport better. So, so really the work we do in helping to train coaches in our apprenticeship programs and our mentorship programs is all about helping give sports the tools to deliver better. And that includes delivering on better gender equity and representation in the coaching ranks and creating environments that are safe and inviting for women to come in. Um, we've spent a lot of the last five years in the safe sports space. We just launched, uh, or tomorrow we're launching a mental health uh, hub with resources to try to affect the mental health of, of our young participants in sport and disadvantaged communities. We have, we have some really solid apprenticeship programs. We Canada Games, so, you know, your love for Canada Games. We work uh, with Canada Games to have a, the partnership with the provinces and territories to have female apprenticeship coaches. So there's a list of things we do, Anastasia. And I think one of the, the messages that I have for everyone here is, is um, it's a, the, the roles we all have are privileged roles. And the minute we stop thinking that it's a privilege to be doing what we're doing, I feel we lose impact. So every day is a privilege for me to contribute to Canada through sport and recreation. Mm -hmm. So all of us need to lean in on these conversations. So it's no one person. So Internally at this, the coaching association with our partners, we really try to focus on engaging everyone in, in finding the right solutions for, for gender equity in sport. So I've probably gone a little off track there on that with you, but it's, I think it's, it, it's, a, it's a broader conversation. And so it has to be about what all of our collective roles are. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, and, and Joanne, feel free to jump in in any capacity or Addie as well. Um, you know, I think of the real like upper echelon, right? Like Emily Castongay is the assistant GM of the Vancouver Canucks. Um, Karina LeBlanc is the GM uh, of, of the Portland Thorns, right? Some really high powered, um, cool Canadian women doing some, some great things in the professional space. Are you seeing kind of a trickle down in the amateur space um, for, for female leaders at present? And if no, like, what can we do to help support folks getting uh, to those upper upper levels? Well, I do think there's some successes. I think at like the provincial, like at the Canada Games level, we have a high retention rate of the f- apprentice coaches who stay in c- the coaching role past their apprentice role at, at the Games. There is a universal struggle look at university data of coaches in universities, and they are arguably the number one employer as a system of coaches in Canada. There is a real struggle to get past 10, 15% in the head coaching roles. It is, it's, it is such a puzzle. So I don't, I honestly don't think we have the answer. We, we see pockets of positivity, um, but it's not systemic, Anastasia. It's not systemic. And part of it is, you know, Joanne, hop in here in all of the media messaging and the role modeling of who fits the profile of a coach that impacts young girls, you know, from quite the young age about what careers they choose. I, mm-hmm. I so strongly agree with that. And, um, I, you know, I keep coming back to my role as an instructor and we, 
had an assignment last semester uh, where I had students talking about different issues, but they had to do some research on sexism in sport. And I, they, they tackled it from so many different angles, sports communication, and from how the language that's used, right, in when reporters are talking about athletes, how they interview athletes differently, how they call a game differently, how, uh, how, how much time and space is given to women's sports. And it was really eye-opening, I think, especially for a lot of uh, my male students who were very much allies in this, but who, who hadn't really looked at it that way. Um, I, I will say I see a lot of really, really good hopeful um, from the communications aspect uh, in the generation coming up. My, uh, my students, seem to work really hard to understand where those biases are. We talk a lot about objectivity and I, I would say breaking that down because of course it doesn't exist. And the concept of objectivity, all that does is exclude a lot of people. And I hope we're at the brink of, of bringing the inclu including a lot more people in the conversation about sports and uh, yeah. And so even, sorry, just jumping in here um, with uh, even from a younger perspective, when you're, you know, you're talking about people in university and all these, when we're interviewing, I would say, you know, maybe girls 16 and under, one of the interesting things that I find that they say a lot is the terminologies that used, it always seems like women are always feeling like they're breaking the barrier. And they're like, when is that barrier just going to be broken? When is it going to be uh -huh. where it's just, you're talking to me because I'm a female athlete and you're talking to him because he's a male athlete. Like, when is that going to happen? I was like, that is fascinating to think that maybe by the terminology we're using, it's like, they're looking at it like, oh, well, this is the first woman to ever do this. And it's like, well, whoa, if she's the first woman, like we got a long way to go instead of being like, well, you're one of many, right? Cause then it seems more attainable. And so from a youth perspective, cause I'm around a lot of nuggets all the time, all these kids <laughs> and coaching. And, you know, it's interesting to hear their perspectives from, they kind of, when they're younger, wish that that whole thing was over. Do you know what I mean? Like they wish that it, it still didn't have to be a conversation, which it definitely still does. But in the sense of like, they're, they see it and they notice it now. So, and maybe that's due to social media being more available with more mm -hmm. little clips that they can see of their sports that they're associated in. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No. So then I, my follow-up for you is, you, you know, you're, you're coaching kids, um, coaching adolescents, like how important is it to have those conversations or to use the right words to ensure that they feel, oh my gosh, you know, like it's a big world, but I'm supported and I can do it. Right. Because to your point, it can be lonely when you feel like you're the only one or there's no hope. Yeah. It's for, for myself and my assistant coach that I'm with right now, it's, uh, it's everything. And my co-host that I have Alicia Cowson um, our terminology, we talk about it all the time because for beauty sports, our, our phrase is rethink how you think about women's sports, not rethink women's sports, rethink how you think about women's sports, because it's there. We have incredible athletes. They're crushing it. And we need to think how we can change that terminology. So they know. So, and it's the smallest things we've had, um, because a lot of references that, you know, people use more naturally is, you know, male athletes. So I'm mainly hockey, but I cover all sports, but there's a drill on the ice and it's called, uh, the Wayne Gretzky. So this year I changed it to the Mary Philip plan. I'm like <laughs> Mary Philip plan and the Natalie Spooner. And they all kind of looked at me and then they all went home and they all watched highlights and they're like, okay, they're unreal. We get it. I was like, yeah, they're the best. They are yeah. the best female athletes in hockey. Like they're unbelievable. Or you could go the Hillary Knight. But when you change the conversation 
even ever, like so slightly in a, instead of it always being about the Jets, talking about what female teams are playing, like the Montreal Force are playing the Toronto Six. Oh, well, what's, when's that game on? right? It's, it's understanding and knowledge. So we, we integrate it in everything. And the coolest part about it is the amount of questions we get back from kids or hearing, listening to our podcast that are like, we did it. We went online and we watched the game and it was unreal. Right. So it's, it's, uh, it's maybe one of the most important things to be educated and talk about it with girls, you know, younger. And I want to bring you all in to talk to my students because it all comes down to language. Right. Yeah. And uh, the, the, I mean, there's been massive studies done on on how sports media talks about women's sports versus men's sports and the language that they use. And it's really it really um, it, it can really sway how people think about it and the perception, like you said, I think language is one of the forgotten but really, really pivotal parts of how we how we should be looking at sports a hundred percent and I think that segues nightly nicely Lorraine I mean with the coaching association of Canada like yeah language is the base of of how we communicate how we shape our world um and language is changing quite rapidly with how we see sports with how we see gender with how we you know recognize individuals like what is the association um doing to you know further that progress yeah, so we have um, we have uh, changed our curriculum. So we go through processes of revising our curriculum, and we very intentionally shifted the language as we revise the curriculum to not be gender biased uh, and to get uh, the you know the the revisions are all participant driven. So. All of the coach training is about putting the participant at the center, and that includes every participant. So by creating curriculum or messaging in our coaching materials that focuses or or provides stereotypes or uses languages that reinforce subconsciously those stereotypes, then it's a real problem. You know, um, uh, Skate Canada had really good leading research where they actually changed their their graphics in their uh, national coaching certification program and their imagery to be very neutral, to be very gender neutral, to provide a safe space for um, all identities to come in and be part of the curriculum and the coach training to reinforce or to remove is a better way the biases that sometimes happen through education. Hundred mm-hmm. percent. I and and I, I mean, Skate Canada also like even the fact that they just said pair skating like it doesn't have to be you know That's like right. they, I yeah I I'm a, it's a really big... it's great to watch them go. It's really cool what uh, Skate Canada is doing, and that's led by a number of phenomenal athletes, being Caitlin Weaver and Asher Hill, and the list goes on and on. They've just really been so passionate and have furthered that narrative for every single sport. Um, I don't know, maybe this is a simple question, but uh, like, how how are we to market female athletes and um, You know, I think that that really kind of plays into almost backing it up five minutes. You know, the the glass ceiling is always breaking, which is something to celebrate. But then it is like, okay, well, how many shards of glass have to fall on us, right? That's right. Yeah. Like, Addy, how 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 would you market female athletes? I I always think let's lean into personality. But yeah, I well, I definitely think there needs to be a lot more like from a perspective of the world juniors, for instance, we get to know those guys, like, like we're in their homes, we're physically in their homes, right? Like we get to know their families. Same thing is happening for women the next week later, and there's nothing. Right. Mm -hmm. So one thing that I've in my, in my dream world that I, because there was that, um, add the M campaign that Christine Sinclair did, um, a little while back, what I think of like would be fantastic because the WNBA and the NWSL are so big. Like there's such like it would be very cool if, and this is 
once again, my dream world, but the NBA, and then there was a men's stream and a women's stream. So they're both a part of the National Basketball Association, but it's men and women, because as athletes, we always look at a podium. The best is at the top. Well, visually, who's always at the top? The NBA, Uh right? So for me, I think there needs to be a more collaborative approach, putting, you know, men and women on the same playing field. And that was evident with the um, NHL 23 when Sarah Nurse was put on it too, just two beauties on a cover, love and life. And everybody (laughs) now knows Sarah Nurse and she's amazing. And you think about if that could be spread you know, across the board, LeBron James and Sue Bird, right? Ronaldo, Abby Wambach, like if, if they were always side by side, people would visually be able to classify them together, right? But yeah. there, I know that there's a lot of stuff that goes on behind the scenes, but when I, when I think about it, every single time that it's been put together, it's never a negative, right? It's never a negative when like they didn't sell less video games because Sarah nurse was on it. All they did was increase girls buying the video game, right. And increased awareness. And then for, you know, young boys to even be able to go on the video game and play as a girl on the team and have a ranking and see that, you know, it's for me, it's that visual of them being together at the highest level that I think would make a huge, huge impact. 100%. And, I want to clarify when I say lean into personalities, uh, that was me, I guess, being uh, vulnerable by saying there's a lot of female athletes that actually are great in a mix zone, <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. to, you know, pucks in deep and it was a team effort. Sorry, yeah. that was my bad joke. <laughs> no. um, from uh, Joanne, though, like from a JSP, from a journalist of standards and practices uh, vantage point, you know, um, you mentioned the importance of of language, certainly, but how do your students yeah tackle you know this is a this is a female sports story this is a men's sports story or is it just all sports stories from your perspective it's all sports stories from my perspective but I do find uh in in 12 years of bringing in sports stories that my 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 women students or if, if they're covering uh women's sport they tend not to push as hard to get, they use different language and they don't push as hard to get mm, stories. So Mm -hmm. stories can be, which I think are important stories as well, but about teamwork and they'll, they'll, they'll interview women athletes and the story will end up being about oh, this isn't about me, it's about my team and we all work together, which I think is great. But I, but I'm, I push them to push past that narrative in the same way they will with men's sports, right? And I, I'm coming back to a word that, you, that you, was used earlier, crushing it, right? Like crushing it is the most awesome terminology. And I, we use that all the time with my kayaking, the, the women I kayak with, we're gonna go crush some K's today. And that, and that terminology is important. And I think there's a lot, both, both men and women communicators who use different verbiage with different sports. And it's, it's kind of insanity that they do mm-hmm. that right? because crushing it is an awesome word that I think should be used for all athletes but it gets tend to use, of course, more with men. So pushing, pushing, my, pushing my students, both, both, both the, men, the men and women that I teach, who are both oh, at that age, they're, they may come in with a bit of bias, but they are so open to learning. They are so, so receptive um, to, to hearing this and learning and, and learning how not to bring their bias to, a story. So I, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of trailing off here, but in, in communications, because again, I, I, I teach Jay, but my students end up going into marketing and communications of sports all across Canada. Um, and I, I, I don't want to see my women 
students just looking, how can I be as good as the guys? What can I bring to the table to be the same as the guys? They have something very different to offer, but it's as equally strong and as equally valid. And I, I, and I'd like to see, I'd like to see the men learn from what the women can bring to the table and have it and have it blend into one big way of looking at sports. Does that make sense? It does. Uh, just a quick follow up, and we kind of had mentioned, or we touched upon it uh, right before we went live. But um, have you found, you know, some of your students using different language, uh, or perhaps softer language, right? Like yeah. it's Sammy Joe Small, right? Uh, one of the all time greats. She's she said, "We will know that we've really found equality when we can say, you know, Haley Wickenheiser had a really crappy game today, or you know." Yeah, obviously Haley's not playing anymore, but uh, Pooh is having a, a crappy game or, you know, Sarah Nurse. Whoa, she was off. Like, are, are we there yet? Or is that still a little bit of a hurdle that we've got to overcome? I think it's a hurdle, but I'll tell you quite honestly, um, get down. Sorry. Uh, uh, quite honestly, that I one of the issues I have with a lot of my with with my men's students is they come in wanting to do sports, but really what they want is to be friends with the athletes, right? Mm -hmm. They want to be in there in the locker room and they're just as unlikely to give that critical analysis. And I think think that women coming in to cover sports is massively important because I think there's so many stories women are more likely to go to other women's sources. They're uncovering things that men may not have noticed in the sports world, right? Um, And so I think my male students have just as much to learn in in verbiage and how to do interviews and how to approach a story um, as my my women students do. That's very cool. Um, Lorraine, I'm sorry. I've, I've, uh, I want to go to you and and hear your voice for a second. You've, you've obviously um, been in a number of roles. What are your strategies, or or what do you really bring into your daily work um, to try and uplift and help grow other leadership skills in you know female staff, female employees, female friends? Yeah. So. Um... I very, very intentionally don't listen to the, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to use the story as an example. This is the best way to describe it. On the same day that somebody came in and said he needed a raise was the same day that another woman came in and said, oh, I'm really worried about so-and-so. Okay. So as a leader, you have to remove that noise from your decision making. Okay. So, so, so it was a big epiphany and this happened like 20 some years ago. It was a big epiphany for me to not be biased by those individuals who, um, who have the, uh, who have the systemic training to be more um, aggressive. And I don't mean aggressive in a negative way, more aggressive in terms of their rights. And and let's be honest, a lot of boys have that. Okay. A lot of young boys and men naturally assume that role and take on that position in their daily life or negotiations. What we need is for women to do, to learn and do the same thing. So my job was to not allow the, that biased behavior around me to influence my, my ethical decision-making. Okay, so that's one. The second thing is working with the women to help them to assume their rightful place. So that is a really important conversation that I have with the young women, particularly young, meaning younger in their careers, for the most part, 
where I talk about where do you want to be in five years from now? What are you going to do? How are we going to get you there? It's not about you staying at coaching. It's about where you want to get to. Tell me you want to be somewhere else in five years. I'm going to help you get there. I'm going to set you up with the other women who are leaders in the sports system. So I think that, you know, that's a really important piece for me. Um, Anastasia, I didn't, I, 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 I think I kind of naturally grew up with a little bit of that assumptive side of me where I just kind of took space um, and I didn't really have that same voice. I mean, we know the research about women deselecting themselves when they see job applications. Oh, I only have 80% of that's on the job advert, so I'm not going to apply. Whereas you might have a male counterpart who says, oh, I've got 50%, I'll learn the other 50% while I'm in the job. It, those are fascinating characteristics that we have to be very mindful of in in our positions where we bring in employees. So we try to codify as much as possible in our hiring practices, as an example, to make sure that we're really not integrating our own biases in our hiring. So, uh, you know, uh, we will be very explicit at times about, uh, about uh, mandating the number of interviews, the number of people who are interviews, making sure um, that we have stripped away bias as much as possible in our language, et cetera. So, you know, I just, I, I really feel like that's a place for all of us. Again, I'm going to come back to it. I really think that all of us in our daily allyship in making sport better can have incremental gains that make a difference for the next generation. Yeah. And if I can just feed off that a little bit too, in the sense of one, one coaching phrase that I've essentially built um, a lot of my strategies off of, but also I found it's very much in the workplace as well, but also in sport is men compete to be respected where women are need to be respected before they compete. And so when I am building any type of programming or doing anything, the respect, the trust, the everything needs to be built in a core foundational piece. And so when we talk about stats, like when we're talking about resumes or women being like, oh, well, I've only coached for maybe five years, I'm not qualified for that job, even though you've lived your life in it, right? It's like you, you're, you're looking for that respect back before you'll go for it. And even when women are training, I find that that's a big connection piece and community piece that they need from their coach is the safety of failing and not being criticized and judged, right? Like the safety of um, not having people, you know, talk behind your back when you do something good, because that is another thing that we encourage like crazy is that you encourage good. So if somebody does something good, their accomplishments, their achievements are amazing and you should compete to try to get there or get higher or do whatever you can but when I find that when I've been working with any athletes from the recruitment side of things I get way more out of them when they know that I respect their journey and respect who they are as people and then the compete is just through the roof yeah you know what I actually just had the pr uh, privilege of chatting with Cameron Rogers who's of course hammer thrower um, and, uh, she was talking about her coach and how wonderful of a bond they have. And it, she said, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, so I apologize, but when they met, he said, I don't just see you as an athlete. I see you as someone's child, you know, like I truly see you as an athlete. And I just thought that, or a, a human, excuse me, I just, I'll never forget that, that saying, like, just that completely changes your mindset when you, when you understand that you have that support. We're going to take a quick break. Um, we will be right back from questions uh, or que with questions, excuse me, from the audience. But let's first take a quick break with our title sponsor, Bryce, Bison Transport. What if you broke the mold? Didn't listen to all the things you were told. What if you really tried? Stood firm when they asked you why. What if you did what they said you couldn't? Achieved 
all the things they said you wouldn't. What if it didn't matter what they told you? What if you stood strong just to prove that you don't belong in the box they built you? How far could you go? How far could you go? How far could you go if you dared to be bold? All right. Well, our first question, I'm just going to give it to Joanne. Joanne, what is your cat's name? Because you have a cute cat that just walked across the. Uh... I, I, I have two cats and uh, um, one, it, the one that walked across here is Ted Baxter. And my other cat is Rhoda Morgenstern. And I, I have to say, I've never been a cat person. I have, I've had dogs all my life. Yeah. And my two senior dogs died this past year. Oh, I'm sorry. And thank you. It was really hard. But my cats, which I, I, I admit I got because I had mice. <laughs> I love these cats. I had no idea that cats could be so um, affectionate and have such personality. So well, I know. I, I loved it. I we're still living semi on the zoom zoom world. So I had to give a shout out to your kitty cat. And I, I got um, I keep an eye on them because they're all over the place right now. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, I admitted that we just got a brand new kitten and I'm thinking she's going to come on screen too. Um, so it's 2023. Like there's a lot of news, unfortunately, that's, you know, it's, it's not all that peachy right now there's some really heavy news um you don't have to look too far even to just see what the canadian women's national team um is going through down in orlando um in relation to canada soccer Uh, we all read the headlines of course and read the news is you know we we have made progress but from your perspectives what is the largest hurdle for women and sport to continue breaking those barriers but hopefully you know to eliminate bias and to say no we belong Addy, you want to tackle that first and foremost for sure yeah it's always the chicken or the egg what came first right like what's going to be media attention or ticket sales or all these different things and and to be honest when I think about it from two different perspectives when we're looking at younger athletes 10 and under That's truly where we learn our value as female athletes. We hear about, okay, well, sports is just to get an education. Well, if you say that to a girl 600 times before the time she's six, she believes it. She doesn't believe that there's this extra thing. So I think terminology that we use with young girls will then trickle down the to build a bigger and brighter future because they'll know and understand and believe and fight for it and be there and compete for it. Uh, for, for all this craziness in the media, um, like I just think putting like, and I genuinely believe this, putting it on TV uh, like more. And I know everyone talks about media and contracts and all these different things. And I get it, but like, the um, March Madness for women last year out did, out did better than the men's. Like the WNBA finals did better than the men's. Like mm-hmm. the Angel City is breaking records like crazy in national women's soccer. It is, there is such a trend, but it seems like it's happening behind the scenes. If we just allowed people to tell their stories, get out there, create a sense of connection where it's easy I think that that would be, it would be a huge change. Huge, huge, huge. Yeah. I mean, 365 million people tuned in for the Euro uh, 2022 final against England and, and Germany. And, you know, you look at even franchise fees in the NWSL, a franchise fee, like in 2012 was $125,000. And now they're selling for 50 million. So there are things that are going, you know, right. But uh, Joanne Lorraine, anything that you want to add from your perspectives right now? Like what's the biggest hurdle to break these bias and break the barriers? 
There, there's so many hurdles from a communication standpoint, but I, I think one little sliver of a nugget is, is allyship, right? Mm -hmm. And, and um, it, every time I see uh, a man uh, talking about sports where he corrects a journalist to say, no, I'm not the first, you know, uh, yeah. who, who just yeah. slips right in and just takes it for granted that no, the, the, the women athletes are, have done it before us, have done it better, have done it. And that should be taken for granted. And, and getting past this concept that, uh, uh, women reporters are there because of some special hiring practice mm -hmm. and, and that women were, women reporters obviously obviously can do the job but the fact that they can bring something different to the table is a good thing um and that men can learn from that as well and i i, I think i'm again i'm seeing a lot of hope in the next generation that they recognize there's lots to learn from women athletes and women reporters and communicators as well that they they bring a lot to the table mm -hmm. lorraine that's a complicated question. So, I mean, I think, uh, you know, with some of our, our, our with Addy, you know, in coaching, uh, you know, you talk about respect and, and I, uh, you know, a lot of women either go into coaching, but they deselect because they don't feel a sense of community. So if you're on a coaching staff of seven men and you're one woman, are you left out of the social environments? Are you feeling supported? Do you have do you have that network to feel like you want to stay in that job? And so that's, we try to play in the allyship and mentorship and sponsorship space where it's okay, I can mentor you, but now I need to sponsor you to be seen in positions of a power or authority in front of your male peers or in front of your peers so that, you know, you get that respect, Addy, so that that's part of it. We, we've had a 50 50 board, you know, 40 60. Uh, board of directors and staff now for 10 years. 50% of our senior management is women. And I'm very clear on making sure, and we still have some gaps. You know, I can still see some areas where I go, I need a better, better representation, better gender balance. But I really feel like those are the steps that we need to take within our own respective workplaces. And it, and it is the question of, it, it is one starfish at a time. I mean, we, we have some system needs that we can address. We try to work with universities to bring in female coaches and commit to them long-term. We, we really need to reflect what can we do every day to create the right environment to make it more diverse for all of us. Mm -hmm. Hundred percent. I actually, Alison Forsyth was on um, uh, two panels ago, and and she said, "Safe sport sometimes is just seen as kind of an island where it is so related to EDI. Like we need to change. We need to change the faces in every single room because you know that will help eliminate some of these problems that continue to that's, unfortunately. That's exactly pop up. right. We yeah. changed our sports safety department." to have EDI as, as their priority in all of our programs and services. And, and I do strongly believe from a reporting standpoint that the wider the voice range, the wider, the wider the story coverage, because you're going to get sources that may not, like, that may not have been talked to before. You're going to get people who know to look under this rock to, to, the coverage is so much more comprehensive um, when you have a wider, diverse range of reporters, 100%. We just have a few more minutes um, left. And so I would love to uh, just ask, you know, what would you like to say to um, girls and women that perhaps want to, you know, take up coaching or just become active in sport or become a journalist? Like, what are some parting words that you would like to to hopefully inspire folks to, I don't know, go for it, I guess. Addy? I think one of the biggest things that what I've come across is um, 
girls being nervous to reach out. So that would be one of the biggest things that I would um, say is if you love it, go for it. If you love it, reach out to people. Every single person in the women's sports world that I've ever come across wants nothing but the best, wants nothing for it to grow and get better. And so if you are on the fence of coaching, mentorship, whatever the case may be, um, don't be afraid to reach out because I think that that's one of the biggest hurdles is, am I good enough? Will, can I make this work is, and it's like, yes, you've done it. Like, let's get cruising. You know what I mean? So it's, I think it's one of those things of had just have it. And if it's, you're nervous the first time, every single person that gets into coaching, mentorship, recruitment, doesn't matter. You go through it with somebody. So reach out and, uh, cause it is truly the best community to be a part of. And maybe that's a good segue. Lorraine mentorship um for coaching <laughs> anything to add there <laughs> well we've got a few programs going on we have one with the black canadian coaches association where we're trying to set up mentors uh to increase and support our uh, dei initiatives oh gosh we have a mentorship model that we built with alberta actually uh and created mentorship a sustainable mentorship model so it's actually on our website anastasia it's one for the mentor one for a guide for the mentor a guide for the mentee and a guide for the organization so they can actually all work together and set it up properly we have the training send us an email at coach.ca and we have all kinds of information that i would share there um, I will tell you my, my message to anybody who is listening is lean in. Confidence comes from trying. It does not come from sitting back and waiting for others to invite you in. Confidence comes from your ability to lean in, try and fail, try and succeed and that's how you go and you grow. And that is absolutely has been my motto. And I truly believe, yes, safe space is important, but it's not always going to be easy. And that is okay. And that is what my cancer journey taught me. I'm telling you, sport prepares you for the unanticipated and the unexpected. That's what a cancer diagnosis is. It's not expected. And it's not anticipated, but the training of sport and a sporting career has been, I can deal with it because I've got more resilience up the wazoo than, than anything because of it. So it's a great career and I really just lean into sport. It's a beautiful space and we need to make it better and safer and lean in and help us do that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I, sorry, John. I just want to say my advice is your voice matters, your voice, your voice, what you bring to the table in sports matters. Don't think I need to be, a, I want to be a sports journalist or a sports announcer or a sports communicator. So I need to start thinking like a guy. I need to start talking like a guy. We need, we need to shatter that and we need to bring, we need to bring the diverse perspectives in, and we need them to be considered objective as well, right? The idea of objectivity, which is, is, is set around a default male voice needs to be blown apart. And I want the women watching today to understand that their perspective and their voice needs to be part of the conversation, needs to, needs to move the conversation forward. Thank you so much for your voices. I mean, I think that's a beautiful way to uh, to end, to to move the conversation forward. I've just, uh, I, every time I do this, I'm like, wow, it's already an, an hour. I, I could talk to you guys for like another billion hours. And I hope that we do on March 7th. Um, I want to say a big, big thank you to everyone for joining us tonight for this session of the Bison Transport Sport Leadership Series. Uh, we hope you had just a fantastic uh a fantastic time with us tonight and you took away some very valuable information from our guests um rethink how you think about women's sports so i'm gonna remember that one addy i loved it your voice matters lean in uh mentorship also i should say uh, sport manitoba also has a fantastic coach uh mentorship program that you should catch up uh, catch up and and connect with if you are 
in any capacity wanting to getting in, get into coaching or admin um, or just connect with fellow coaches. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I always just, yeah, I always end this evening with such a big smile on my face. Thank you to our sponsors for sharing um, speaker speaker, excuse me, for sharing your stories tonight. Again, thank you to our title sponsor, Bison Transport. This would not be possible without Bison Transport. So thank you so much. Tonight's session will be available on demand on Sport Manitoba's YouTube, YouTube channel or at sportmanitoba.ca slash lead her ship. So again, not leadership, lead her ship. Uh, we hope you will join us on March 7th in person for the finish line of the 2022-2023 Bison Transport Sport Leadership Series. Registration is open and free at sportmanitoba.ca slash leadership. I will be there. It will be so fun. Great networking, food, drinks, games, prizes, you name it. Uh, it's going to be a fantastic night. Thank you so much for joining us and have a, have a great, great Wednesday.